Uh, this meeting our, is being recorded. Let's begin our uh, board meeting with, of course, the establishment of our quorum. So, Marcin, do you want to do the roll call? Yes, I'll go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Board member Weeks. Present. Board member Pham. History member, oh, public member. <laughs> Present. <laughs> Board member Crabtree. Present. Board member Ellis. Board member Fairley. Board member Fairley present. Board member Isbell. Board member Matos. Thank you. That is seven members present. That is a quorum. Thank you very much. So let's let's begin our meeting. I have a a quick couple of remarks. Um, uh, first of all, there's a bit of a disappointment that obviously we were hoping to meet in person today, but uh, COVID got to us again, and we're unable to do that safely at the present time. So. Hopefully our next board meeting will be one in which we can actually shake hands and meet each other in person for some of you that are, that are that, that I even haven't met in person. Um, we've also had to cancel the Southern California DRC meeting because of, of COVID and that's a that's a real bear to reschedule again. So the staff is working on that. Now that we're starting a new year, we can look back upon last year and each of us can be should be very proud of what we accomplished as a board it was really an eventful year sb803 SB was the milestone for our board that was the probably the most important piece of of legislation that we we put through or, and, and began working on um, in the recent history of the board and, and and those of you that were on the board most of you are on the board doing that and voting for that um, you should be very pleased that you changed the lives of our licensed candidates for the good. I mean, a reduction of 600 hours in required course load time is really, that's huge for a student out there, both economically and time-wise. So um, you did a good thing. Very, very proud of the whole board and what we did. We had um, one board resignation, uh, Christy Tran, uh, has had to leave the board. She uh, stated that she was uh, busy with her business right now because of COVID and loss of personnel. So she's busy. We we thank her for her service and and um, and and we we move on from here. The the governor is in the midst uh, of actively reviewing candidates for us. So I anticipate that unlike sometimes in the past. We're going to have a pretty rapid turnaround and add those three or four new board positions uh, uh, very quickly. So may maybe we'll be in place by, by our next board meeting. The This year uh, is going to be another eventful year. Now we're dealing with the implementation of SB 803. We have a larger board now. And because of the size of the board in the past, a smaller board, the board's taken a lot of work where our standing committee should have done that work or could have done that work. Um, now we're going to, today we're going to appoint uh, members of our standing committees so that the, the committees can uh, uh, organize themselves and uh, the standing committees will each appoint their own chairman. Um, we're, we're, again, quickly working to, to staff our board up to what it should be, but as opposed to times in the past, we're going to really depend on our standing committees. The staff has done an excellent job of working on implementation of 803 um, already, and we'll see that in our meeting today. So with that, um, let me ask if there are any other board member remarks. And I take it there are not at this stage. That being the case, let's um, move ahead to our annual uh, election of officers for the board. Do we have uh, any nominations? I, I guess we start with president. Nominate Steve Weeks for president. 
Um, this is board member Callie Mae Pham. I would like to second that nomination. Like the third that nomination. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Good. Good morning. Will that um, nominate will that nominated person accept that assignment should they be elected? This nominated person will <laughs> accept that assignment. I, I like I working wanted, with all the members of this board. Thank you. I just wanted to double check before we took public comment on the motion as well as uh, and then came back for the vote. All right. So do we vote on each uh, each office? Correct. So we have a motion and a second for this particular office, and then we'll take public comment on the motion, and then we'll do a vote, and then we'll move on to the next officer. Okay, let's move now to public comment. Open the Q&A panel, which will be the vehicle we will use for today's public comment session. If you'd like to make a public comment, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen. Looks like a question mark inside of a square, typically located at the right bottom corner of your screen. That will open a text box. In that text box, you can simply type the word comment and then submit that to our panelists. We'll be allowing two minutes today for public comment. I will provide a 30 second, re-morning, 30 second warning when your time is about to expire. Your time expires, I will let you know it is expired. Mute your microphone and move to our next commenter. We will be taking comments in the order that they are received. And with that, I'm not seeing any requests for comment at this time. Would you like me to close the panel? Please. It is closed. And at this stage, we will uh, 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 vote for the... Uh, uh, the officer, Steve Weeks, is president. So, Marcine, will you yes. do the roll call? Yes. Member Weeks. Yes. <laughs> Member Pham. Member Crabtree. Yes. Member Ellis. Member Fairley. Yes. Member Isbell and Member Matos. Uh, yes. All right, you have seven yeses. Congratulations. If you wanted to say a few words, this would be your time. Yes, Steve, thank sorry, you. you're muted. I'm sorry. Thank you all for, for voting for me for president. I'm anxious to serve. My This will be my, my last year as president, and um, I hope it'll be an exciting one. It'll, it'll also help us all see 803 through to completion. So now um, we are voting for uh, or nominating for uh, vice president of the board. Are there any nominations by the board members? Crabtree, I would like to nominate Calumet. I would second. Callie May, would you accept that? Should you be elected? Yes, thank you. Thank you. We can have public comment on this motion and then we can have our vote. Let's move to public comment then. Again, open that Q&A panel. If you'd like to comment on the motion before you, please click on that Q&A icon on your screen. Type comment into the text field and submit that to our panelists. And seeing no request for comment, would you like me to close the panel? Please close it. It is closed. All right. And if um, Marcin, you will uh, take the roll call vote for uh, vice president. Yes. Uh, Member Weeks. Yes. Member Pham. Yes. Member Crabtree. Member Ellis. Yes. Member Fairley. Member Isbell. Yes. 
Member Matos. Thank you, that is seven yeses. Excellent. So, uh, tell me you are uh, elected as vice president for this, this coming year. Let's now move uh, away from our election of officers to the uh, appointment of our standing committees. Again, we have, we have six standing committees that operate. Um, they've not been particularly active uh, over the recent past simply because, as I said earlier, we have a small enough board where we're able to, to deal with them at the board level, although they could really use some, some more depth analysis, especially with uh, 803 coming in at the uh, uh, committee level. So what we want to do of the six committees, obviously we need a minimum of two person per committee. Uh, the committee then will meet and elect their chairman and um, we'll be scheduling the meeting. The board board members can be active in, in, in wanting to schedule any of the uh, committee uh, meetings that are that are necessary for our business. So let's begin with uh, the, uh, the, the most time consuming one is probably the disciplinary review committee. And on DRC, we typically would want to have as many officers who had the time to do this. It's it's a, often a multi-day commitment. In person, it's a, it's a two and a half day commitment with, that you could travel uh, to do it. So you have to kind of be prepared to take, be able to take some time off in the near future for that. So um, I'm willing to take, um, long, yeah. Um, this is uh, board member Isabel. I just have a question about the process for this. Um, are, are we um, self, um, are, are we putting ourselves on a specific committee or is someone assigning us? And, or do we have um, a number of committees? Are we only supposed to pick one or is it a number of them or something like that? Very good point. No, uh, first of all, the, to answer your last question, you can serve on a number of committees. That's not a problem. And the way we normally do it is we take uh, board member volunteers of who would wish to serve on each individual committee. So uh, you would be nominating yourself uh, uh, for these individual committees, and uh, that's that's basically how it would operate. The um, again. DRC Disciplinary Review Committee is an unusual committee because it takes so long. So be prepared for that if if you if you volunteer. So let 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 me ask first: Would it, who would like to be appointed to the Disciplinary Review Committee? Can I ask another question too before that one? Sure, sure. Is there, um, because I review these, and I'm I, I'm as interested as I am in where do we find additional information as to actual what is involved in the committee process, being a part of the committee. Being a, po being a point of the individual committees. Yes. Um, Christy, do you have a, an answer to that? Sure. So and can everybody hear me okay? Just making sure. Yes. Okay, great. So um, on the individual committees, um, you know, in the past, our board has been, um, a, as still is, been able to handle a lot of this work at the board level, but we do recognize with our board member um, our board population increasing that we think we could get um, a lot of use out of the committee structure. So what we will normally do is likely have committee meetings prior to a board meeting um, that would then, um, if we have a topic that goes to that committee, that committee would make a recommendation to the full board. So the committee would would take, um, it'd, be, it'd be a shorter structure, a smaller structure, so less members, kind of more of a working environment where we would have the meetings on particular topics and then make a recommendation to the full board um, for those committees. Um, does that help, Tanya? Yes, the second part of my question will be, um, so if as a board member, say I wanted to be a part of one of the boards, where does the additional committee members come from? Is that something, oh. okay. It's all board members. These are okay. all, it's just a smaller committee of the board. Okay, all right, then there we go. And so to answer Steve's question, yes, I would like to be a part of DRC. 
And, and, and just another added note to the DRC, keep in mind that we all, um, for those of you who have been on the DRC, you know that our staff work very close with you. So um, we really like everyone to say they would, uh, would be a part of this committee because maybe you can only do one day, maybe you can't do it this month, but you could do it next month. So we work very much with all of our members to coordinate with your schedules as well. And, and this is, this is Jackie. I can do DRC. And Marcine, are you are you making notes of who the individuals are for the for our um, uh, record? Yes. Okay. I mean, right now, I think we're just on DRC, correct? DRC. And Jackie and I would also be interested in serving on DRC. And this is Can't Sabina by yourself. This is Sabina, if I could interject real quick. For those newer board members, you can look under agenda item five, and there's a little blurb about each um, committee in there to kind of help you see what each committee is going to be addressing. I always say our committees are where the heavy lifting happens because they are vetting out um, sometimes legislation, sometimes regulations, sometimes uh, policies or something like that to go to the full board. It's a great working environment and um, committee members get a lot of work done and, and really learn about the Practice Act and the industry. Thank you. That was what I was, I don't, I looked at this and I swear I didn't see this page. <laughs> Thank you, Sabina. No worries. Yeah, it probably got, it, mine got actually stuck to the first page. I didn't see it there initially either. Yeah, because when I went through there, I was like, okay, I know I want to do something, but I need a little bit more uh, info. So yes, okay. uh, DRC, See, I'm into. <laughs> I'd also like to join the DRC. Yes. Hello, this is Callie May. I will also join DRC. Thank you. This is Marcine. So right now I have Jackie, Steve, Tanya, Reese, and Callie May. There are no uh, additional ones. We could uh, uh, move on to our next committee, standing committee, and that would be the Education and Outreach Committee. I would also wanted to be a part of the Education and Outreach Committee. I'm sorry, Board Member Fairley. I would also, this is Board Member Isabel. This is Board Member Matos. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, Mr. Matos, please, please go first. Uh, Board Member Matos, I'll be interested in the Education Outreach Committee as well. Board Member Megan Ellis, I would be interested in the health, uh, in the Education and Outreach Committee as well. Okay, that would be four board members uh, to serve on the Education and Outreach Committee. The next is the Enforcement and Inspections Committee. And I would be willing to serve on that. I'd be willing to serve on that. The others? You and me, Steve, we got this. Hey, we're a team. We're a team, girl. <laughs> okay, so that's two of us on Enforcement and Inspections Committee. The next standing committee is Health and Safety Advisory Committee. You skipped legislative and budget. Uh, oh, I'm going by the notes on on, on item five, the individual, but that's okay. Legislative and budget, we can go there next. Let's do it now. Um, Legis I, legislative and budget. I would like to be on legislative and budget. This is Board Member Isabel. Okay. Sam, I'd also like to serve on this committee. This is board member Ellis. I would be uh, interested in uh, serving on legislative and budget committee as well. Yes, I too show interest in legislative and budget committee. All right, that looks like we have an appointment of four board members for the legislative and budget committee. Now let's move on to the health and safety advisory committee. And just a quick note on our health and safety advisory committee. This is our one committee other than the DRC that is statutorily 
um, required. So this is a committee that involves um, a lot of other appointees from the industry. We have a member of each license um, category on that committee, as well as Department of Public Health, um, um, Division of Department of Industrial Relations. We have um, uh, infection control um, personnel, as well as a scientist on that committee. Crabtree, I'd like to serve on that committee. This is board member Pham. I'd also like to serve on this committee. Well, I will also join health and safety. All right, so we have three board members to be uh, appointed to the Health and Safety Advisory Committee. And uh, the last would be Licensing and Examination Committee. This and is board, uh, board member Tanya Fairley, and I would like to serve on this committee. Thanks, Tanya. This is this is Steve Weeks. I'd like to serve on the committee also. This is Jackie Crabtree. I'd like to serve as well. This is Derek Matos. I have interest in that as well. All right. So I believe we're four members on of that committee. And do we need to vote on this or is this just a matter of record? I need to vote on this as the president always has the authority to place anybody on a committee, even if not during a public meeting. Okay. Well, in that case, I want to thank everyone for their involvement and willing to step up on this because I, I, I do know that the extra uh, committees can sometimes get uh, uh, a lot of time involved in that. And, and, and this is a year that several of these committees are really going to be crucial in our implement implementation of 803. Let's then move to um, item number six in our agenda, which is the approval of the October 25th board meeting minutes. Do we have, uh, take a few minutes to, re to um, review them if you haven't in depth and uh, then we'll take a motion. This is board member Crabtree. I'd like to put a motion to approve the minutes. Am I'd like to second that motion. All right, so we have a motion in play and a second to approve the board meeting minutes. Should we go to uh, public comment? That is correct. Open that Q&A panel. If you'd like to comment on the motion before you, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen, type comment into the text field and submit that to our panelists. And seeing no requests, would you like me to close the panel? Please. It is closed. All right, so now we are ready to uh, vote on the approval of the October 21st, 25th, 2021 board meeting minutes. And uh, Marcin, will you take the roll call? Uh, yes. Board member Weeks? Yes. Board member Pham? Board member Crabtree? Yes. Board member Ellis? Board member Fairley? Yes. Board member Isbell? Board member Matos? Thank you, that's seven yeses. And the minutes have been approved. Let's now move to item number seven on today's agenda, which is the our executive officer's report. So I'll turn it over now to Christy. Um, so I have a lot to report on today. Um, we in our office have um, finally succumbed to some of the pandemic uh, downfalls. Um, we've um, been struggling as of late with um, positivity and close contacts. So we are actually back to full uh, telecommuting. All of our staff is at home. Um, we made that decision about a week and a half ago um, with the numbers being being so high. And um, 
hopefully our, our staff will return safe and healthy in February. Um, however, we were already set up to work from home, so we aren't seeing any impacts with that. So that's good news. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through our statistics that are within the packet um, and kind of point out some changes that we're going to be seeing in the coming board meetings um, with things that are changing because of SB 803. There will be some shifting quite a bit in some of the statistics. So to start with is our quarterly applications received. And um, that's pretty standard. We did see some lower numbers come in on applications um, through the holidays. Um, and that's, that's usually kind of typical for um, our workload. Um, next is our examination results. We'll obviously be seeing these change um, after this meeting as we will we no longer have a practical exam as of January 1. Um, we've had some implementation bumps along the road with getting um, our systems to um, uh, change processes. So we're still working with the Department of Consumer Affairs with um, and many of our, our vendors to try to get things where they need to be. Um, right now, things are slowly there. Um, we consider um, a person who has passed um, a portion of the exam, whether it was practical or written, that score is valid for one year, which ultimately made everyone that passed the written exam within the past year eligible for licensure. So we've worked with PSI, our computer-based testing vendor, to issue licenses on, um, it was a little over 2,000 records. Um, and those have, um, as of just this last week, all been processed. Um, we've unfortunately had to input the license information manually into our system. So we've got a team of people that are working on that and should be done with that um, today or tomorrow. Um, hopefully, hopefully this week that'll all be cleaned up. People that were expecting a license should have it in their hand within a week or so. Um, and it should be able to be viewed on Breeze in the license lookup system. So that's a you're going to see a big change in our statistics at our next board meeting because it's the issuance of a little over 2,000 licenses of people who have passed the written exam. Um, and then, of course, as we change to a written only exam, we'll be um, looking at those statistics and how they're coming in and seeing if there's more information that we can share on these reports um, that um, would be helpful to the board. We'll still, of course, be tracking it by language and, and provide that as well. Um, okay, so any questions on any of that so far? Christy, this is board member Pham. I have a question. For the written exam, um, is it going to be the same written exam going forward and we just remove the practical or have we revamped the written exam? The, as of right now, the written exam is the same exam that it's always been. Thank you. Okay, so moving forward um, on to uh, page five, you'll see our licenses issued. That's what you're going to see a significant increase in at the next board meeting. Um, and then, of course, our current population is on there as well. Um, we pretty much always seem to stay in the 615,000 licensee mark. Um, next, you'll see our disciplinary review committee. Um, there's not a lot of change here because, of course, we haven't been having any um, hearings. We really thought we were going to get some of these done in February, but as uh, Board President Weeks mentioned, we were had to cancel that um, for the safety of all. And um, luckily, we're not receiving too many um, appeals at this time to um, increase that backlog. Um, so hopefully, um, we will see some light at the end of this tunnel and be able to have these DRC hearings soon. Um, our enforcement stats are next. Those are pretty standard, not anything um, shocking or out of the norm in that area. And then we move on to our budget. Oh, did you have a question? I just have a quick question uh -huh. on the enforcement statistics. What's happening in the field out now, right now with, with uh, COVID as far as our inspectors are concerned? Our inspectors are doing actually really well. Um, we do still have five 
five or six vacancies. Um, so, um, but we have brought on several new inspectors over the last few months, and they're doing really great, actually. So um, our inspections program is probably um, probably the least impacted, to be honest, and um, doing really good out in the field. Um, of course, they've been the most trained in making sure they wear their um, protection as they go in and into um, establishments. However, their numbers are good and they are inspectors that we had are have been super helpful to cover some of our vacant territories. So we do not have any backlog in any directeds. Um, a directed is when we have a consumer complaint and we need to send an inspector to a specific establishment. We have no backlog in that area because our inspectors have really stepped up and helped us throughout California. Um, so we're doing that's that's a great unit that we're we're really excelling in at this time. That's great news. Is the uh, were you able to absorb staff uh, elsewhere in our organization from the two offices that we had to close because of the, the practical not being given anymore? We were, um, not many, um, because most of those positions in our exam sites were specialty positions in a sense. They were, um, their class state classification is um, examiner. Um, and so that wasn't a position. Um, they were also permanent intermittents, which is not something we could have absorbed. So we did have a lot of people that were furloughed. However, we did, um, we were able to maintain a few of that, those staff that are now helping us in mostly in our licensing unit because that's obviously always where we have um the highest population um and we did have some people that had retired we actually had some people that had been planning to retire ahead of time anyways and were kind enough to stay out through the end of the year for us to keep those exam sites going so we did have some retirements we will be able to take those positions where the people retired from and transfer them to Sacramento as vacant positions to be able to fill behind. And we're looking to fill behind those positions in our licensing unit because we have PSP coming down the line. Um, probably in a couple of months, we'll be implementing that. And we always can use all the help possible in our, in our licensing unit. Uh, this is board member Isabel. Um, this is, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still new, but I have, mm -hmm. uh, a question just looking over these statistics i noticed that um it, it would seem that the from um the page nine um that complaints are down and inspections are down but the number of citations went up really high and i'm wondering how that came about so we our inspectors do routine inspections and that's that creates a citation so, um, and our board is um, is definitely a citation and fine based enforcement um, board, whereas um, another board might send more cases to the attorney general's office for discipline. We rely um, greatly on our citation and fine uh, program. So, in, when an inspector goes in and does an inspection, it, that inspection report then comes to Sacramento and we review it in a unit, um, we call that unit cite, cite and fine, and they determine if a citation should be issued. Um, so even though our inspectors are doing directed inspections where a complaint may have sent them, they will go do an inspection at one of those, but then they'll inspect as many establishments as they can in that area. So that, and then ultimately those are gonna generate a citation. So the cita our citation numbers are always high. Any other questions before we move on? Um, Chrissy, this is board member Pham again. Um, I just had a question going back to just DRC. I know that yeah. unfortunately we've had to reschedule quite a few attempted rounds um, of in-person DRC. I know we've done other things over the last year. We did um, kind of uh, virtual DRC with written testimony and we've done obviously reinstatement hearings virtually. I'm just wondering, is there something um, I, I don't know what the outlook will be for the next few months, but I wonder if, if that kind of model would be possible for DRC where we have people come on camera and, and give testimony that way. Just I know that just because we've had to, you know, keep changing our plans so many times. Um, so, I, you know, I just wanted to raise that as, a, you know, whether that's something that we could possibly consider or try. But thank you. 
Yes, thank you. And we've definitely looked into it. First, we do encourage the written testimony so that um, a, an individual doesn't have to appear regardless. We we have give that option. We've looked into trying to do a virtual um, DRC. Um, it's difficult um, technology wise to get that many people to be ready on the technology. We actually, for our reinstatement hearings, um, we actually spend a lot of work with those petitioners on uh, testing with them. And with DRC, we just haven't have the capability to test it with each individual um, appellant. However, just so um, so everyone knows, especially the new members, um, any a, a, a licensee can appeal their citation that they receive. And when they do appeal that citation, it kind of becomes frozen. So it doesn't prevent them from working and it doesn't prevent them from renewing their license as long as they've appealed that, um, that citation. So for the licensee standpoint, it works out um, okay for them because there's no negative impact to the, to the licensee. For the board staff, <laughs> It, the impact that we are watching is that workload getting any higher. Um, prior to most members that are currently on the board, this has always been a notorious area where we've had a backlog. And our board, our DRC staff and our past board members and some of our current board members have worked very hard to get rid of that backlog. So we're right at the, the spot right now where um, we're hoping we can definitely have that hearing in the next couple of months and it should be able to keep us within our, our timeframes that we like to stay at. Thank you for that context, Christy. Okay, so moving on to our budget, the budget. I just wanna say that our budget right now is um, very much um, stable, is for sure, but we are have going to be having a lot of changes in how our budget looks probably over this year for sure. A lot of things have happened that are going to impact our budget that we'll need to wait and see how it stabilizes out. For one, we had the waivers that the governor issued at, for licensing fees. Those went out, so we weren't receiving that revenue in for uh, renewals. But then we did receive um, a payback from the general fu general fund, so it offsets it. That's a little bit confusing to see on paper. Well, then we have SB 803. For SB 803, we were able to cancel our lease on our facility in Fairfield. So that's going to be a significant cost savings in the budget. We have not been able to cancel our lease in our Glendale facility. So we are still working with our Glendale facility, the building owner, and unfortunately, that building is for sale right now where we are at. So we are in um, limbo right now to see if we will be able to get out of that lease. Um, the, the SB 803 did have some costs in, um, for the implementation. We've had to, um, we have some breeze costs that are coming our way. Um, we have had um, the... Um, Sorry, I got, got, got off track there a second. But basically our, our budget is losing some and gaining some. And then we have the PSP coming in in just a couple of months. So that's going to not only increase our workload, but it's also going to increase the revenue that's coming into our board. So I, we just met with our budget office on Friday, just this past Friday, and it is just an interesting situation that we're in with our budget right now. Um, this this board also always had a very um, significant budget. We don't have any budget concerns. We still don't have any budget concerns, but it is something that is going to be changing in our budget reports over the next um, year, to be honest, as we see SB 803 get implemented, as we get out of our leases, um, and as, as well as not offering the practical exam, that is a huge contract that we've also had. So there's contracts coming in, um, contracts going out, implementation costs. And we, at, at this point in the year, we just don't have, um, it, it's just gonna be a lot of fluctuation. Again, we met with DCA budget office on Friday. So we do feel that our allotment and our projected expenditures are very close. We've built in 
as much as we could um, to our projected expenditures. We've, we're buying some new vehicles this year. We are currently translating our entire package of laws and regulations, um, which is um, because of so many changes from SB 803, that translation is a significant cost. Um, but so we've built all that in already. Everything that we can think of, plus moving out some of our savings from um, eliminating our leases, eliminating our contract for the practical exam, is shown in our in our allotment. So you can see that the bottom line on page 11 shows that our budget is, is um, solvent and secure, which we knew it would be. It's just a warning that this will continue to fluctuate over the next year as we see these things come and go for SB803. Can I ask you a question, uh, Christy? Yes. So for our, our fiscal year 21-22, what we're looking at there is um, there's no surprise in this. This seems no. to be pretty much as projected. But Definitely. Then when we go to the next page and look at our months in reserve and in, in 2021, we had almost 36 months in reserve. Then we went down to 17. Now we're down to 7.2. And there's a probability of less than 6% in the next year. Why is this diminishment in our uh, months in reserve? So it's because of the what has happened with the renewal fees and the renewal fee payback and the way it was done through um, the budget office. And we we wouldn't we should never have a, a reserve that at that 35.9 right. that's astronomical right. that is um when we get into the 7.2 and the 5.9 that is standard for us so we're it, it, the way the budgeting was done um out of our control that's why we saw these these numbers um increase um, but but when we get into the 22, 23, and the 23, 24, that and those numbers and reserves, that's standard for us. So that's where we want to be, and that's where this is showing that it's going to even out through all this very confusing budget um, changes once once it settles down. What do you find? What do you hear on other boards as their uh, a more typical uh, months in reserve that they maintain? Oh, I think we are definitely one of the um, luckier boards in the department. <laughs> we have a, I, I, just from experience being 25 plus years in, in DCA, there are boards that, um, especially some of our smaller boards, definitely don't have months in reserve. So they're, they're, you know, have to watch their budgets with a fine tooth comb. Um, but this board has been um, significantly stable for, for many, many years. What does the department want to see in months in reserve? Is there an average figure that they have? Well, some boards actually have it in their statute that they can't have more than a three month reserve. Um, but we do not. So um, I can tell you that if we had a 35 month reserve in reality, we would need to be looking at our fees. Um, yes. You know, we, we shouldn't be bringing in. We're not a for profit organization. Um, right. And I will say also that we are going to be looking at our fees. So that is something that's going to play into this as well. We no longer have a practical exam. So right. we are going to have to look um, into our fees. We're going to need to do a fee study. It's something that we should be doing anyways um, and determining really what should our fees be to a brand new applicant that's applying for licensure. So that is on the that will be done um, this year as well. Great. Thanks, Christy. Hi, Christy, Tanya Fairley here. Um, you referred a couple of times to PSP and excuse me for my ignorance, but what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't use those, those acronyms. PSP is the personal service permit that the board is implementing. Um, and it is when a licensee can apply for a personal service permit to go along with their cosmetologist, barber license, or any, any of their other personal licenses. And then that would allow them to do services outside of a licensed establishment, specified services. We have, it is a limited services, um, so they can't do everything that they would in an establishment, but it does allow them to, um, to go do services outside of a licensed establishment. Those are regulations that have honestly been in the process for about four years that the board's been working on and the regulations have been implemented and now we're just waiting for our IT systems to be finalized. And we are anticipating that 
um, in possibly March or April to be finally um, finished with that. And a, a big change to our internal operating operations at that is to get a PSP, you have to do a fingerprint background check. Um, because you're going into somebody's home, we want to make sure that consumers are safe. So fingerprint um, check will be required through the Department of Justice. So it's it's a brand new workload that our um, staff will have to address. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, hi, Christy, it's Jackie. So with that um, PSP, though, I would think that maybe it's going to change the budget, obviously, because you're going to be moving funds around to do the those things as well. Um, kudos, I'd love to have a 35% reserve in my own business. <laughs> and then lastly, what is the, what do we charge again for the fee for licensee? So currently the fee for license um, varies by license type from, I believe, 35 um, for, uh, you know, a manicurist, I believe is around 35 and it goes up to 50. Um, and uh, the exam fee, I believe is 75. So it's around 120, $125 for an initial application. To me, that's not that much money, but you know, whatever you guys decide on. That's interesting, thank you. It's not, but I will say that we do have a statute that states that the board shall only charge what it costs us to do. So, um, so that's what we'll have to look at is what is our true cost now for processing applications? How are our costs compared to uh, other state boards, uh, barbering and cosmetology around the nation? Are we about the average uh, 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 costs that are being paid for licensing? No, I believe we're in some of the lower um, we're definitely lower. And honestly, it's likely because of our population. Um, our volume is so high. So, to you know, it, it, it actually brings the cost down. Um, whereas in a lot of other states, they don't have that volume. So it costs them a lot more to process those applications. Makes sense. Okay, hearing no more questions, we'll move on to outreach. We've provided um, some um, information on some events that I have participated in virtually with um, several groups and also what we have tentatively scheduled uh, for the future. You can see on our tentative that um, I am scheduled to attend another um, meeting with the Council of State Governments. That's the project for compact licensing where um, we'll have the option to enter into a compact so that um, anyone who's licensed in California can work in a state that is also part of that compact with their California license. Um, that group has pro been processed through the um, um, technical advisory um, aspect and is now in the document writing um, portion. And they have asked me to be a part of that um, a, as well. And so there is a meeting in DC coming up in March and um, hopefully um, I'll, I, I will have to submit for out of state travel for that. So hopefully that should get approved and um, California can continue to be a part of it. It's really, I think it's really exciting and it could be um, super helpful for a lot of um, licensees throughout the country. No questions on that, we'll move to the big one. And that is our implementation of SB 803. I was reviewing our notes last night for the board meeting and our um, our, our two pages make it seem, seem so simple. Um, it's been um, quite, quite a bit of, of work for our staff over the last um, several weeks, um, but we have done um, quite a bit and made a lot of progress in implementing SB 803. Um, as um, was mentioned earlier, um, our board members numbers did increase. And um, as board president Weeks mentioned, the, the governor's office is working on that. So hopefully by our next meeting, we'll have more members um, to fingers crossed meet in public. <laughs> um, so that is that is moving. The hairstylist license that is brand new. That is the one, um, one of the few items in 803 that's going to take some time to implement. For 803, 
I'm, I'm sorry, for the hairstylist license, there's several things that have to be done. And the first thing that has to be done is an occupational analysis and as well as exam development. So we have already entered into a contract with the Department of Consumer Affairs to handle that workload for us. Um, I believe they've already started recruiting people to get that, that process done. Um, but we are looking at, I would say, a minimum of 18 months before that new license can be um, implemented. It's just a lot of work that goes into starting a new a new license um, before we even get to the actual IT portion of, of implementation. So that's going to take some time. Christy, I have a question. This yes. is board member Tanya Fairley. In regards to the task force that are on these, are there industry experts that are helping with these particular um, um, re-implementations? And if so, um, yeah, that's my that's my question. Like in with SB eight hundred three, a lot of these uh, changes are directly affecting, you know, the industry, of course. Yes. So the people that are on the task force or or designated are they part of the industry, or is it just DCA? Um, oh no, they're all industry. Um, DCA it has an office of professional examination services. And they are the coordinators and they are the psychometricians who know the business of conducting occupational analysis. But what we do is recruit for industry experts. So everything that will be done is done with, with people from the industry. Thank you. Uh-huh. I needed that question answered anyway for my tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. Next, um, the, as we know, the esthetician scope has been updated. We have put an industry bulletin up on our website to provide information um, to individuals. Um, you know, the estheticians can use dermaplaning right now. Um, lash and brow tinting is still not available because the FDA says so. Um, the only way we can make lash and brow tinting actually happen in, in California is by changing the regulations. Those regulations are going to be reviewed by the Health and Safety Committee um, at our next meeting, which we're hoping to have in March. And um, But as of right now, um, according to the FDA and the way our current regulations are written, lash and brow tinting still cannot be done. However, when it can be done, we want to make sure that our estheticians are able to do it. So that is... Um, that is, you know, one of the big things in SB 803 that we wanted to, to make happen. Um, our reciprocity has changed. Previously, it was three out of the last five years that you had to be licensed in order to get reciprocity, and now that is no longer valid. You can get a license um, in California with your valid license from another state. We have already implemented that. We still have technical um, IT pieces to implement, but internally through our um, staff, we've been able to implement that and are processing those applications now. The pre-apprentice training that will now be going to be required to be um, done by the board is something that will take a little bit of time to implement um, because we have to develop not only the curriculum, but we have to develop the actual, um, we would like it to be a web-based uh, training program. So we will have to contract out for those services. Um, we are working in conjunction with experts within DCA to help us on that so that we'll be able to um, provide that contract. And what, what we envision happening is all of you have had to take um, sexual harassment training where I believe it's a two hour training and you can't cheat. You can't get ahead of that two hours. You can, you can stop and walk away, but when you come back, you've got to pick up where you left off. And that's how we envision the pre-apprentice training going. So we will need um, a vendor to be able to develop that type of system for us. So we are expecting this. Um, we, I would like to be very ambitious and have this um, completed within the next 12 months, but that is that is a very ambitious goal, but we will definitely be working towards that. Um, as of now, it's um, business as usual for the apprentice program, so um, they can continue to offer that program until the board is able to implement this, this piece of um, 803. The removal have, of the pre-app, um, I'm sorry, sorry, is there a question? I have another question. Uh -huh. uh, um, in regards to the pre-apprentice training, um, are they allowing the schools to also sign up for 
um, a particular um, the to be a test site, or is it going to only be done in Sacramento, or is it something they just do online? We envision it being a hundred percent online. Okay. Okay, so next is um, the removal of the pre-app, which um, was completed and um, we no longer accept pre-apps um, and almost almost all of our pre-apps that had been in the system um, have been processed. We still have a few applicants that need proof of training submitted to the board. Um, so those are slowly um, getting cleaned up within our database. Um, as mentioned, the removal of the practical, the most significant um, is the actual facilities and our staffing um, that has um, all been taken care of. We have actually had movers over the last two weeks remove all of our equipment from the two facilities, um, as well as PSI as they subcontracted a room in each one of our facilities. Um, so there has been a lot of work um, that has gone down in the in, in January. Um, with our staff and um, our exam site um, individuals that are that are still there helping us. So we are completely out of both of those facilities. Um, and we have um, addressed all of our staff. And we have the new um, process going where an applicant will apply and get scheduled only for the written exam. That has been um, quite the undertaking, um, dealing with all the different IT systems that need to talk to each other. Um, but we are at a place now, literally just this morning, <laughs> where things are moving forward and we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel on the implementation of that aspect. So eventually it should be very smooth for students. We should be able to get those applications processed very quickly. And once they receive the notification from PSI, the student will be able to go online and schedule their own exam um, at their, at their uh, request of whichever location they would like to attend, um, or they're able to call PSI directly and schedule that examination as well. So um, eventually we think it's going to be a fairly quick streamlined process that's, that's going to um, help both the students and our staffing, because it takes a huge chunk of work away from our staffing for the scheduling of pre-apps and the practical exam was a huge workload. Any questions on that? Question in regards to that. Uh -huh. how, many, how many of those test sites are uh, currently active in the state of California? I believe there are at least 15, if not more. I know there was, there's a minimum of 15, but there could be more than 15. Got it. And do you, do you see uh, this potentially going from site to the same way as we're doing like pre-apprentice training um, sometime in the future of being completely online? Um, I know that it's a possibility, and I do know that there are some other states that are looking to go completely virtual with their testing. Um, we haven't um, really looked at that yet, but I think it's definitely in the future and something that, that we can look into. I'd be curious to see how you monitor that virtually when they're test taking. Yeah, there's definitely been some states. Um, I know Texas um, did virtual testing and I know Minnesota is getting ready to move to 100% virtual. So they do have processes in place for how they monitor, but um, I'm not 100% familiar with it. Okay, moving on to our mobile unit. Um, that has been implemented. It was mostly just an updating of our application and how we process those, those applications. Um, next is the school curriculum. This has been a big one for us and a lot of workload that we've um, received. Um, this, as of January 13th, when we put the agenda packet together, there were 159 schools that had um, submitted applications to us for a new course. Um, 146 of those had been approved with 13 were still pending. Um, when we get more applications every day, we're up to 155 as of this morning of schools that have been approved. 
Um, schools are doing various things. Um, you know, one of the changes that was made um, that was amended into SB 803 was allowing a minimum of a thousand hours, but it could be more. Um, and so there are schools who have opted to maintain. Um, some schools have opted to, with no change at all. Um, some schools have reduced to a thousand hours. Some schools have reduced to twelve hundred hours. Um, we have schools that have um, come up with a 1500 hour program. So it is it is um, a little different for us um, because we've always had just such the standard 1500 and 1600. Um, but with the majority of schools have gone that have been approved, have gone to the um, thousand hours for barbering and thousand hours for cosmetology. When you say school, Chris, you're talking about actual schools, not the apprenticeship schools. Correct. Okay. Actual um, traditional schools. Are approved and on our website. There is the list of schools that of approved schools on our website. Yes. Does it also indicate uh, next to each school on our website the number of hours that that school has elected to have for curriculum? It does not. Um, I don't know that we even have that capability to do. Um, we are actually working with Breeze right now to figure out how to even put that on our system for us to see. Um, and so we'll, we are looking at that. Um, again, schools have to be approved by the Bureau of Post-Secondary and us. Um, and um, so, that, so they can look up those schools on either one, but you, I don't even believe that under the Bureau you can look up to determine if a school is it what the hours are that they're approved for. The, the Bureau doesn't post that as well. It's something yes. actually we just discovered. Yeah, from a consumer perspective, obviously that would be very helpful. Could we make a statement on that page where we list all of the approved schools stating that uh, hours may vary by school, check with yeah. individual schools, somehow letting them know that uh, everything isn't exactly standard on this? Definitely, we can do that right away. Great. That's a good idea on that, but um, I, I'm sure we don't know yet because it's still so early. I wonder how many people are enrolling in um, schools that are still doing 1600 versus the thousand. Yeah, we don't know. Um, and unfortunately, we may not ever know because our board does not have any oversight over enrollments. Um, I wish we did. Um, student, If we had student enrollment at the time, I think it could be um, a deterrent for selling of hours. Um, so I think it's maybe something that we could bring up in one of our newly formed committees to revisit. It's something that we've brought up in our sunset reviews in the past is student registration. Um, but we we have, um, I can say we have already seen, received a couple of applications from students that said they completed a thousand hours, which we questioned because we just approved a thousand hours. However, you a student can, um, disenroll uh, or drop their 1600 hour program and re-enroll in a thousand hour program. And hours are transferable if they're like for like. So um, we've only received a couple and I actually personally reached out to the schools that we received those from just to make sure we were all on the same page. Um, but moving forward, we're working internally with how we can make sure um, we are we are really reviewing these to make sure you know the potential for fraud is going to be there for the proof of training. I've been talking to um, I, the Professional Beauty Federation and has been a big help in getting out information to schools and something we've been working on um, to prevent fraud from happening. And I think um, you'll see coming up that we're doing some cleanup language for SB 803. And I think one of the things we're going to do is um, really need some input from these schools on how to make sure we can prevent fraud because we all know that that's a real situation that's out there. Um, and that proof of training, um, we need to probably make some changes to so that we can make sure we have some safeguards in place to prevent that. Good point, because I was thinking about all that with folks thinking, okay, well, I've done this, but even though you've done, you know, not like for like, how that's going to 
move down the road so that we can make sure the consumers stay safe with the training. Right. And we're getting a lot of questions from students who are enrolled in 1600 hour programs who are have reached 1000 hours in their program and think they qualify for the exam, which is not the case. You have to complete a program. So rather you've completed what you've, you know, again, we don't have any jurisdiction over enrollment or over student contracts. So what we're telling students is, um, you know, you're in contract for 1600 hours with a school. It, the school would have, you'd have to drop out of that contract and re-enroll um, to be able to actually complete. It's not just meeting the, the thousand hours that we, that makes you eligible for the exam. It's completing an approved program that makes you el eligible for the exam. So quick question, on the few schools who have allowed their students to drop and then re-enroll, are you seeing much of that or what, what, does that look like? Um, I've had, I would say less than five. Oh, that's good. So hopefully. And, and they were, luckily they were schools um, that I'm very familiar with. So I, I had contacts at these, just so happened that I had contacts at these schools and was able to talk to them directly. So. And what, um, what was their response? I'm just curious to see how the school industry is handling that. Well, well, I can tell you that of these um, four or five candidates that came to us, I believe at least three of them, maybe four of four, there were only two schools involved. So there were only two schools that I've talked to that didn't did say that the employee or I'm sorry, that the student did drop from their program and then did finish the requirements for their their approved thousand hour program. And the schools in question do have an approval from both us and the Bureau of Private Post-Secondary for that new program. So that's one of the things that I have staff. Um, we just implemented a new process this weekend for making sure that these, these programs, the new programs are indeed approved by both um, our board and the Bureau to make sure um, that, that they're legitimate approved courses. And we've been working really close with the Bureau on all of this. Um, so they've they've actually really stepped up and helped a ton with this new process. And um, we've, they're probably sick of me because we've been in touch with, with their license. I've been in touch with their licensing chief pretty much on a daily basis. So um, they've been a, been a really big help um, with this transition. Which is great. I mean, because yes. as we know, all this is gonna keep happening. So I, you know, cause I had a question once asked to me that say a student was in a program for a while, decided to drop. Now they hear that, you know, it's less hours. So when they come to re-enroll, those hours that they did have will apply to um, the re-enrollment, correct? They could, yes. Good, okay, thank you. Christy, do, do any of, our, of these schools require a minimum enrollment period to complete their program? Not just in courses that are taken or hours associated with courses, but say if they wanted to come in, they have to be a student of that school for X amount of time regardless? Um, I'm not aware of that. It's certainly not something we would ever know. And I don't know if that's something that's possible for schools to do. Okay, wouldn't wanna see that, yeah. Derek, did you have a question? Um, yeah, so I just had a quick question in, in regard to the curriculum. So the all of these schools can now submit for different curriculum. There's no particular baseline curriculum or I know there was a standard previously that they kind of had to all reach. So is it now that standard uh, with the provisions or the changes made for the reduction in hours, or is it just a free for all where all schools can just come up with whatever curriculum they want. And as long as it sees fit, sees fit from BPE and the board, um, they can go ahead and do that. So that's that's so the first part of the question. There is a, there is the curriculum that is set in statute now, as opposed to being in regulations. So they still have to have 
the standard curriculum. Um, I can see that um, some schools are adding hours to certain areas. So say um, 200 hours are required in chemical services. And there are some schools that may be doing 400 hours in chemical services because that's what the school um, would want. So what we look at when we review the curriculum is that they have to have that minimum thousand hours and it has to cover all of the content that we have in the statute that was spelled out in SB 803. So the content's all the same, but yes, you can have more. And you could have done that in the past. Um, not a lot of schools did. It was maybe a little more common in some of the shorter courses there. It was common for manicuring courses, which is required to be 400 hours. But there's a lot of schools out there that offer a 600 hour manicuring course. So that's nothing, nothing new that schools have done. It's just much on, on a bigger scale now. Um, because traditionally the, the Cosmo was done at 1600 and the Barber was done at 1500. Uh, last part of that is, would the school be required to notate that somehow or does the board do that? Similar to what uh, Steve asked earlier about the school hours being posted, is this something that we're looking to do as well or is it just too much to track? What the schools have to do is my understanding through the Bureau of Private Post-Secondary is because um, because our law requires a thousand hours in a student contract, they have to they have to notify the student that the state requirement is a thousand, but our course is sixteen hundred. So they do have to disclose that to a student, but that falls under the Bureau of Private Post Secondary and not under us. Christy, do you see that some of the, how they're shifting it is just not doing as many technical um, requirements within the thousand hours to reduce that? Um, I can say that most schools have used the breakdown that is in the statute. Um, you know, the, the 200 chemical services, 200 hair services. So most schools are sticking to what is actually in the um the statute there that doesn't completely go up to a thousand hours. So we've seen schools um, that have added in, you know, business skills um, to their curriculum um, and different, or, or like I said, increased in certain areas is what is some. Thank you. Okay, hearing no more questions on that, we'll keep going. Um, next is our extern program, which we are working. Um, we needed to do some cleanup language on that. That has been submitted, um, and hopefully we will get that in a bill. But that in SB 803, the changes that were made to the externs, unfortunately, only mentioned cosmetologists, and we need it to mention barbers as well. Um, so I don't see any reason why that wouldn't get into a bill this year for our cleanup. Um, and so hopefully... Hopefully in our next meeting, we will start to see some, some legislative language coming out. Um, we needed to update our practice status survey, which that has been completed. Our, our next item, which is um, one of our others that could take a little bit of time, is looking at our fine schedule. And SB 803 required us to review our fine schedule to determine what a direct impact to consumer safety each of our fines has. So we will take this up with our health and safety committee, which again is hopefully um, going to meet in March. The health and safety committee will look at that and then make a recommendation to the full board. And once the full board um, receives that and approves um, any direction that, that we might go, then regulations would be needed. So unfortunately that is a long process. So um, hopefully we, we get it done um, crystal clean when we when we put that language together and that helps the regulation process go quicker. But, um, you, you know, we're looking at one to two years for regulations to get done. And then lastly, we of course have our, S oh, sorry, um, Derek, go ahead. Sorry, thank you. Uh, just have one question in regard to the extern. And I don't know if there's something that we'll discuss later because it's at a later agenda item, number nine. Um, but in regard to the externship, 
My, stu my question was uh, in the amend proposal, I guess, in section 7395, um, it states that the appropriate training means a student extern has completed, it goes from 60 to 25% of the required minimum hours. Um, I just wanted clarification because as I interpret this and reading it, that would mean that they would only have to be in school for 25% of that time and then be able to be an extern in a salon or a shop for the remainder. Am I reading that correctly? Or is um, it actually that just That doesn't sound right. Okay, because I know when we first discussed this in the, the previous meetings, the 25% of externship was just that. It was supposed to be just 25% the Correct. remainder into the shops okay so correct. just just for my own clarification does does that sound correct or was that incorrectly written or am um, i just uh, so interpreting you, that have you looked ahead to the actual regulation language yes where are you okay we will make sure when we get to that that we fix that because okay. it's 25 percent. got it thank you Okay, so our SB803 information page is still up on our website. We still have a Q&A up there. Um, and then as the actual bill is on, on the page, um, our new um, S, uh, laws and regulations are also on our website. And um, that about covers it, and it still makes it seem a lot simpler in talking about it than it is actually doing it. Um, but is there any more questions on the implementation of SB803? Can I just make a statement that I, I don't want to downplay the amount of, of work that's necessary to implement 803 that rests for staff in the months ahead. But can I say that in the short time that we voted on 803 and staff began working on it, they've completed 70% of the implementation uh, items. I mean, you've really you guys have really done a great job of digging in on this and doing it quickly. And um, it's a great compliment to your staff that they could accomplish that amount of work in that short a time. Thank you. I agree. I second that. When I was reading this, I was so blown away by how much was completed, really. I was like, wow. <laughs> So, I mean, kudos to you and thank you so much for all the hard work that um, that you and staff have done to get this going. And I was gonna say too, especially being a salon owner and a stylist to know, to kind of get the insight of what's already been done and completed on the back end. It definitely, um, yes, thank you. Um, that's that's a lot of work. <laughs> so it's that's great. Thank you. And most of them are listening. Um, my team that has been um, very instrumental in all of this. So we definitely appreciate all of that. That concludes the executive officer report. Great. Well, let's move on with Christy helping us through the next couple of sections. Let's move into the status updates. Item number eight on the agenda. Status updates regarding rulemaking proposals. Can I just ask one more question? Uh, this is uh -huh. board member Bell. Um, I don't see it on the agenda, but I just wondered if you had any updates on the process of um, the new board members' um, spaces that are um, currently available and the timing around that. I'm just worried about future quorums. Yes, as am I. And um, I have actually been working with um, Deputy Director Kerry Holmes we thought we'd actually have a new member by this meeting but it didn't happen so we are very hopeful we have at least two more members um very soon here um and then hopefully um we get some people that apply from the industry i can tell you we are looking for an esthetician an electrologist and a manicurist those are our three industry seats that we have so if anyone is listening, we encourage you to go to the governor's website under um, the appointments tab and make an application to the governor. But I do think by our next meeting and hopefully even sooner rather than later, um, I do know they have some some in the mix that we um, uh, will be having very soon. And thank you all for responding to 
you when I had a panic attack that we might not have a quorum for this meeting. Um, <laughs> thank you for all being here. And I just um, want to pause real quick. I'm being told, I believe, that maybe we should have public comment on the executive officer's report. In that case, let's move to public comment on the executive officer's report. In the Q&A panel, if you'd like to make a comment on any part of the report given by the executive officer, please click on that Q&A icon, type comment into the text field, and submit that to our panelists. We have one request for comment from Wendy Cochran. Wendy, I sent a request to unmute your microphone. You will need to click on the unmute me button that appears at your end and wait for the finishing of the uh, recorded message. Hi, I've unmuted. Can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hi, it's Wendy Cochran from California Aesthetic Alliance. Um, I'm so pleased. Um, and saddened that we're not there in person for this meeting, but um, thank you very much for having us anyways. I do want to thank Christy Underwood for um, attending our event in Ventura, the California Aesthetic Compliance event, uh, to discuss all these great changes that the estheticians worked very, very hard for over the last several years and engaged with the legislature. I have to say I'm so incredibly incredibly impressed by their professionalism and their positive engagement with the lawmakers. And so Christy will be um, hopefully attending our, our event and the correct date for that is Sunday, February 27th in Ventura. I know in the notes it mentioned that it was the 26th, um, but you know, come into town early and have a great time with us in Ventura. Um, and we are just thrilled with all the work that the board supported us in um, expanding our scope of practice. And we are looking forward to um, uh, the tent update in the regulations very much so. Um, we know that we're all very excited to implement these processes um, and we are already working very diligently on our education in dermaplaning and safety for dermaplaning, our education in lash, lash lift and brow laminations and safety in those services. And we're very much looking forward to tinting very soon. So thank you to the board. Thank you to all the estheticians that contributed and made this massive change to our aesthetic scope of practice. And I apologize for my very small dog making noise in the background. Um, I promise I won't bring her to any meetings when we meet in the future. So I hope to see you next quarter. Thank you. Thank you. And with not seeing any further requests, would you like me to close the panel? It is closed. All right, we will now move ahead to item eight on the agenda, status updates regarding rulemaking proposals. And Christy, you wanna walk us through that? I sure will. Um, so on agenda item number eight, this is just an update on regulation packages. We have two regulation packages that are whole, on hold because we needed to get some legislative cleanup done. That's our extern um, regulation package as well as our disciplinary review committee package. The statutory change that um, is needed um, for disciplinary review committee is there's a section we, we missed um, in 803 where it allows us to pay our members um, of the disciplinary review committee. And as many times as we looked at that bill, we it got missed by multiple people. So hopefully that will be in our cleanup language, but we want to hold off on any regulations until we have that done. And then we have um, a couple of packages that are currently under internal review. That's our apprenticeship package. That's, of course, our very large apprenticeship package. We're working with our um, consumer affairs uh, reg unit to get through um, those regulations and then as well as our disciplinary guidelines update. So that is just an, um, a status. No action is needed on any of those packages. Any questions from any board members? If not, let's move to um, item number nine. 
Um, this is board member fam. I just had a question. So this language has already been submitted and it's it's just pending, correct? There's no more changes that are okay. Thank you. Correct. Any other questions? If not, go ahead, Christy. Okay. On item number nine, you will see um, proposed cleanup language for SB 803. We will not be asking the board to vote um, for this today, but we did want to at least provide you with some language as to where we are going. Um, what this regulation does is adds, um, again, this is cleanup for 803. So everything that we're doing in this package is a result of SB 803. Um, we are adding the word hairstylist into various um, sections. We are going to be clarifying the proof of training requirements in this package. We will be removing sections that no longer apply, such as the pre-application process, and then cleaning up um, some of our forms um, that are in here as well. Um, anytime we make a change to a form, we have to reference that form in regulations. So that's actually where we are in the process right now is updating some of our forms and that will all come back to the board at the next meeting and you should be able to receive a see a final regulation package at the next meeting that we would be asking for about um, any questions see, yes it's Callie may again oh i think this is what i was looking at earlier um on page 20 of 22 under um, 962 definitions i was just curious if all uh, for item a1 if all of the licensing category should be listed there as as a definition of good standing because it just lists the four um so section 7395.1 i think it refers to you know um where you can be an apprentice and at that establishment everyone needs to be in good standing and then good standing means um these license categories and i was just thinking oh well what if what about you know if you have electrologists there or um, this new category of hairstylists um, also at the salon. Technically, they would not fall under this definition of good standing. So I just wanted to raise that as something to look Got at. Got it. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Yes. I have a question on section 12, item C. Um, it's the, the small paragraph that, that's been struck saying, the board recommends that schools provide training in the area of communication skills that includes professional ethics, salesmanship, decorum, record keeping, client service records, basic tax responsibility related to independent contractors, Booth runners, employees, employees. I, I've always thought that was a, a pretty good. I'm, I'm, I realize we're restricted in hours now that we we don't have in the past, but um, a recommendation there, if it could be done, seems to me like something that would be very helpful to someone just getting their license. And the reason why it is um, struck out in this package is because this is the the past curriculum, and now that curriculum is set in statute. Um, so, um, I'm not sure we could have a standalone recommendation in regulations, but it's something we can look at if we wanted to keep something like that in, um, in writing, but it would be, it's out because the whole curriculum came out and got put into statute. Right, right. Not changing it as part of the curriculum, I would agree that we shouldn't go that far, but I, I really like the idea that we're giving at least the schools are giving some heads up advice to people entering this profession for the first time. Last thing we want them to do is to, you know, get their license and fall on their face. So we owe them something there. If, if somehow a, a recommendation could be put in, maybe you could look at that as a possibility. We definitely will. Okay, thanks. All right, are we finished with now? We're going to um, board uh, item number 10, discussion on rulemaking and amending Title 16. 
Okay, for um, agenda item number 10 in your packet is some language, <clears throat> excuse me, for transfer of credit. So the statute basically states that anything can and can be transferred that is like for like, to, to put it plainly. Um, we had looked at this, the board has looked at transfer of credit license in the past, and we had recommended that this the regulation actually be removed completely because the statute states that anything that is um, the same can be transferred from one course to another. However, after reviews with um, our legal regulations unit, they felt we should still clarify that in regulations. So that is the language that is being presented to you today. Um, you can see that we have struck out what was there before and we have now made it very clear for each license type if you were going to go to a go through a course of a different license type what from that prior course can be transferred into a new course so for instance if you're a cosmo if you're a licensed cosmetologist and you want to become a barber you have to take an additional 200 hours in barbering um so this um language is what we have clarifying the entire um, aspect of anyone who can transfer anything. Um, the board's approval of this today would allow us to start the regulatory process. So um, I would stress that it is starting the regulatory process. So from here, it still has to go through um, internal reviews. It will then have to go for public comment period um, for regulations. For any of you who might not know, it has to go through a 45 day comment period where we then receive public comments on any of the changes, and then we would have to bring that back to the board um, with our responses for the board to vote on again. So um, your approval today is allowing us to move forward to start the um, rulemaking process. Christy, I have a question. Any part. questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, I do have a question. So would this be, is this based on the new $1,000 or $1,000? <laughs> thousand hour requirement, and if it is, how did we determine the course hours for each individual um, item? Like it says here in um, um, what is this? B B. What is this? Um, it says two hundred instruction hours in chemical services. So if we determine in the new thousand hours that that's 200 hours is what's allotted for the chemical services. Correct. So really it's, um, it becomes up to the school. Um, so if a, if, if a school has a student that comes to them and they have, um, they want to enroll and they say they've, they've already um, completed 400 hours in another school, that's, that school that's taking on that student, it's really going to be their responsibility, as it has been in the past, um, to really um, look at the information that the school, the student is providing to determine what they would need to do and what they would be able to, to credit that student for. Because ultimately, it's the final school where the student is completing the program that's going to submit to us the final POT where they've graduated that allows them to sit for the exam. And the school has to provide that information of where they've attained hours from another school as well. So that's documented on their final proof of training as well. Thank you. Any other discussion by the board members? If not, um, we could entertain a motion. I wanted to point out to you have this lovely memo in your board packet that should you approve the language, the memo is already up in there for you. It's that long paragraph we all love to say. And um, and also, like Christy already pointed out, this is not the last time you're going to see this language. You're going to see this <laughs> um, come back back and forth probably plenty of times uh, after the comment during the comment periods or after. Uh, hi, this is Jackie Crabtree. I'd like to put a motion forward for all this language. Great. Right. Did you want to read that on um, agenda item number ten, the memo? Sure. The, or did you want me to? 
Um, you go ahead, Ollie. We'll do <laughs> and you say what it needs to say. Thank you. So the motion would be to approve the proposed reg regulatory text for section 950.10. Direct staff to submit the text to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency for review. And if no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process, make any non-substantive changes to the package and set the matter for a hearing if requested. If no adverse comments are received during the 45 day comment period, no hearing is requested. Authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking and adopt the proposed regulations of uh, section 950.10 as noticed. Jackie was going to say that off the top of her head anyway. Totally. I, I do, we have, do we have a second? This is board member fam. I second the motion. Okay, so the motion and second. Let's now move to public comment. This is the moderator. We've opened that Q&A panel. To make a comment on the motion before you, click on the Q&A icon on your screen, type comment into the text field, and submit that to our panelists. And our first comment comes from Wendy Cochran. Wendy, I've sent a request to unmute your microphone. And California Aesthetic Alliance. Uh, real briefly, in the language of the cleanup for SB 803, we want to make sure that it is um, in the aesthetic scope that we talk about skin care on the body of a person rather than calling out individual body parts. Um, the language that was left behind was very kind of um, obtuse. And I think that if you are allowing us to do skin care on the body, we don't need to call out, um, you know, the left elbow and the right shoulder and the upper part of the body because no one really knows what the upper part of the body is. It always goes up for debate and how to get around uh, uh, loopholes and regulations. Secondly, in that language, we need to make sure that the hairstylist only, hair only license, should not be performing facial and skin care services. The language that is currently in the bill um, as of the end of the year uh, did allow for uh, hairstylists only to, in their 600 hour program, to be able to do skin care as well. And uh, that is not appropriate. Um, with regard to crossover, it's like you guys have completely forgot electrology and I'm here to stand up for all the 1500 electrology licensees and the fact that there are so many, so many of our 90,000 plus estheticians that really want to have that crossover be made easily for them to pick up that electrology license because we are partially trained in what they do anyways with hair removal. We understand high frequency, we understand current as it's regard to the body, and it would be a very, very easy transition for many uh, aestheticians to cross over and pick up that electrology lang language and license uh, without a lot of difficulty and save that part of the industry. As many of you know, electrology is very important to the transition of people um, in their changes of gender reassignment. And uh, right now, all of our electrologists are in their 60s and retiring. We need to make a move now to make this change happen and have estheticians cross over in their license. Thank you. Thank you. And not seeing any additional requests for comment, would you like me to close the panel? Please do. It is closed. All right. Now we are set for a vote on this. Um, Marcine, will you uh, take the vote for the board? All right. Member Weeks? Yes. Board Member Pham? Yes. Board Member Crabtree? Board Member Ellis? Yes. Bye -bye. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Board member Fairley. Board member Isbell. Yes. And board member Matos. Yes. You have seven yeses. Motion passes. 
can pass. Let's now move on to one of our final items on our agenda, which is item number 11, consideration of the action to initiate rulemaking to amend Title 16. So, Christy, do you want to lead us through this? Sure will. Okay, so on agenda item 11, this is a regulation package that has been going through the process. It is regarding um, removing certain um, the approval of textbooks by the National Interstate Council. This regulation was actually um, started quite some time ago because um, the National Interstate Council actually doesn't approve textbooks. Um, so we wanted to make this change um, to get that language taken out, which we have done and clarified the language that the board has previously approved. We've since had a 45 day comment period on these regulations, and we did receive a couple of comments um, based on that public comment period. You can see those in your packet um, under pages one and two um, at the back of that language. And what we are asking the board to do is to make a motion to reject these comments as noted in the agenda packet. Um, and provide the responses um, to the comments as indicated in the materials and complete this regulatory process. So we're talking about two motions, one to reject the comments and whether to move the other to move ahead on the motion. I believe that can be in one motion. Okay. Uh, Sabrina, do you want to give us uh, the motion so we don't miss anything? Of course, it's in your memo again. <clears throat> Sorry, agenda item number 11. So the motion will be to direct staff to reject the comments, provide the responses to the comments as indicated in the meeting materials, and complete the regulatory process. And do we have any discussion by board members? In that case, who would like to make the motion? Becky Crabtree. Um, Board Member Callie May Pham, I'll second. Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. Let's move to uh, public comment. Here we begin open the Q&A panel. If you'd like to comment on this motion before you click on that Q&A icon on your screen, type comment into the text field and submit that to our panelists. Not seeing any requests, would you like me to close the panel? Please. It is closed. All right, now we can move to a vote on the motion. And uh, uh, Marcin, can you uh, call the board vote? Yes. Board member Weeks? Yes. Board member Pham? Board member Crabtree? Yes. Board member Ellis? Board member Fairley? Yes. Board member Isbell? Board member Matos? Yes. And you have seven yeses. That's passed. This is board member Isbell. May I make a comment? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm just looking at uh, um, the last section of the um, new language where it says, um, uh, the very last words, non-English languages, it's about translations and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the California law or generally or how we normally phrase these things, but I'm wondering if we if we might in the future look to phrases that aren't a negative, like non-English and more inclusive of the language that, is, that the board uses. I think that's a great comment, <laughs> and yeah. we, we look forward to you helping us with that. But maybe our council can see if there's any reason we have any language we could use other than than that too. That would be good to look at. All right. So now we are at uh, item number twelve, and this is general public comment, and uh, let, let's move to that.
again, open that Q&A panel. If you'd like to make a comment on items not on today's agenda, please click on that Q&A icon, type on the comment into the text box and submit that to our panelists. Our first comment comes from Jamie Schrebeck. Jamie, I've sent a request to unmute your microphone. Good morning. This is Jamie Schrebeck from Precision Nails. Again, fabulous meeting, and it goes without saying that there's so much work that went into the transition to implement SB 803, and that will be ongoing. But I would like to encourage the board to take a more active role in the upcoming sunset review for the bureau who oversees the schools, because we have this shared oversight with most of it belonging to the bureau. And because the bureau was only authorized for another year, this is yet another opportunity for the board to gain sole oversight if that's what the board chooses to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, and not seeing any other requests for comment, would you like me to close the panel? Please do. It is closed. All right, now we're, we're back to our board, and does any board members have suggestions for any future agenda items? Right now we're covering so much, so many areas. This is Tanya Fairley, and I, being new, um, I think one of the things I would like for the uh, agenda items in the future is understanding what activities the board members can participate in um, outside of the board as far as, um, I guess I don't know if I really phrased that question, um, uh, being a presence of the board, but not being a part of the board committee. Uh, can I give you the scenario of the question? <laughs> sure. Um, so I had any I had a request to um, for a school that was opening, um, and they wanted someone from the board to be there. And um, we went through the whole legal situation, and the request was denied. Um, and what the school was looking for was just a presence of someone giving, you know, the additional, you know, um. Uh, pamphlets and, you know, answering any basic questions because it was a new school opening. And I still don't understand why it was denied. And I've gone over the email and looked at it, but I just think that um, because I haven't seen it, um, when things like this arise, there should be a, I don't know, I guess a little bit more, not freedom, but flexibility maybe with being able to participate in things like that because what people are looking for is to see that we care um and so that was a that was a tough pill to swallow not on a personal level but just understanding what we can be participate in well i i think you did a, a good job of, of running it by council to begin with but i i think the primary worry would be that if an individual school wanted a board member there to participate in their opening ceremonies or whatever it may be, um, it could be kind of an implied endorsement of that school um, by the board. Uh, a few years ago, we had an incident in which uh, we had a, a literature table set up uh, in, in Southern California for some meeting of, of a school that brought other people together, not just our board, where there were other people. And we did that, but it was it was awkward to say the least for us because the the what happened is the host pretty well worked it into a situation that uh, we were we were there sponsoring them, we were there uh, 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 rather endorsing them. So I think we have to stay clear of individual of of, of us being used possibly against uh, unknowingly in a situation where it looks like an endorsement of a uh, private business. 
Hey, and this is this is Sabine. If I could interject, um, I just want to make sure we stay on course here with our agenda item. Uh, one, uh, there shouldn't be any discussion. It's just suggestions. And then um, I'm sure Christy has additional information on any of the ethics training or information or materials. If you needed additional uh, resources for that, um, that kind of information on parameters, and uh, we do have a uh, ethics officer in our division. And um, but I just want to kind of wrangle us back in on our agenda item. Well, you wrangled us back in. And there's Sorry, only, <laughs> does anyone else have any suggestions for future agenda items? Um, this is board member Pham. I, I, maybe it would be appropriate for a future item for as part of the director's report, but I'd like to us to come back to the issue of um, uh, the written exam kind of pass rates for, for non-English takers. Uh, you know, this has been an ongoing issue for a long time. And now that we're switching, you know, entirely to written, I think it's even more paramount. I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but I, I would like us to um, be able to come back and kind of focus in on that issue. What do we think the causes are? What are some possible solutions? Since, you know, people are not gonna have the, even just looking at kind of the results or in the report today, it's clear that people do better on the practical exam generally than they do on the written. And so if we're getting rid of that, I think, yeah, we need to be really sensitive about um, these language access issues. So thank you. Yes. Anyone uh, else have any ideas? Yeah, this is board member Isbell. Um, I'm just thinking uh, as I'm one of the new people along with several others and then three more are coming on that are also new um, and we aren't able to have in-person meetings at this time. I, I think it might be useful just to have um, uh, a virtual session where we get to know each other a little bit uh, as I don't know if that can be an agenda item, but just an opportunity for us to know each other. Is there a, a meetings code that we may be violating on that? I, I've always thought it was a great idea for the board to get together outside just personally, but. Right, right. Well, well um, of course you cannot discuss board business, right? Um, okay. That, or that would be a big, a big violation of that would be a board meeting. Um, I believe, I think we all have faith that we're going to be back in person soon. We're going to be back to our evening dinners together or uh, lunches. Um, but I, I think we can definitely keep that on our radar as we see the climate moving forward with the virus. Um, and we can definitely try to um, address something like that. But I don't know if it necessarily has to be an agenda item. So, but we have our staff notating that right now. Okay. And I'm less of a, um, I guess, it, uh, for, for in regards to a meeting, less of a, um, uh, um, uh, getting to know you and more of a uh, welcome to all the new members because it's going to be like six new members, right? Um, and so um, we, I know when I started last month, there was a brief welcome of me, but there wasn't really a welcome to the whole group. And I think we're going to have all these new people soon. So um, I'm thinking along those lines. Um, obviously, when we're in person, there are opportunities to do lunches and things like that. Um, um, but that wouldn't be a formal situation. So uh, as far as agenda items, that's what I was thinking. Any other comments or agenda items? Just one comment um, for all of you that we also will be looking to be doing our new strategic plan. Um, so we don't have a date yet for that. Um, the wonderful people that are helping us with this meeting today will be helping us with our strategic planning that hopefully we'll have some new members because that could also be um, a good meeting that people might be able to be more um, get to know each other. But we will be doing that this year. Our strategic plan is in its last year. So um, we will be contacting you for that um, to start our plan for our next five years of where the board will be going. Well, on that uh, increase of the workload that everyone has to do, staff and board, we should probably uh, go ahead and uh, end this meeting. It's been almost two hours, and um, we should adjourn the meeting. So 
We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. It's good at least Thank seeing you. you video. Hopefully, hopefully next time we'll get to see you in person. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all.